instead. Um, and so in my own practice, I uh, use my grandpa's old 30-06, you know, bolt action, and a canoe. Like it. A canoe is the mo it's an old wooden one, but that's like the most modern thing because it's more of a modern boat, but I'm just trying to keep it as simple and traditional as possible and relying on my human power, that energy. Right. Um, you know, when somebody has like a, whatever those AR-15s and like a two-mile scope, and uh, six by six with uh, three trailers attached and you know, five stands and they're baiting and like I don't know I really struggle with that approach and it seems um, detached from the spirit of it mm -hmm. and the practice of harvesting from the land um, it seems selfish and it seems filled with ego which I think um, you know, technology definitely provides its benefits, and they're usually successful, but I'm not sure if they're successful for the right reasons. Right. So I, I'm challenged by that, and typically will avoid the environments where the you know, there might be other hunters that are engaging in that type of practice around hunting. And thankfully, our corporations hold you know, vast amounts of land, and um, as shareholders, we, we have the opportunity to... Um, engage with that land in that way. Mm -hmm. So I'm incredibly grateful for that opportunity. I think with everything there's a spectrum and uh, my concern mostly lies with you know that 20% on the far extreme spectrum, no connection, trophy hunting, right. like those types of mm -hmm. mental spaces, guided hunts to just get the antlers. And that That's what really bothers me, the blending of traditional practices and maintaining the independence subsistence lifestyle in the, the communities that are still able to practice that absolutely like right. do it um, but I think I'm not aware of the perpetuation in a strong sense of rites of passage for young Alaska Native people um, and I think it's a body of knowledge and process that needs attention and support in retaining regionally because it's very specific to every mm -hmm. um, tribe and even you know, broader region but I think those mm -hmm. rites of passage ceremonies um, prepare hunters since we're talking about hunters in a lot of ways to maintain that spiritual integrity when right. engaging with the practice to avoid that like strong ego like <gasps> yeah it's there but it's a little different you know there's definitely pride always in being a provider but like you said it's a slippery slope yeah I think it takes um... I see food as medicine mm -hmm. period and I think it's a big disconnect in our western model um, I think a lot of the health disparities in indigenous people and minorities um, and low income status, there we go, are forced to eat these processed foods and processed meats. And like, if food is medicine, then it can be poison. And if like you think about the factory farm food meats, and like the trauma that their entire life is and the food that they're eating is like this cornmeal and genetically modified food and so that is poison to them and so then it's just like you're you're poisoning yourself with that food um, and so I see food as a foundation for economy and health and I think in our rural communities there's an economic opportunity to break away from the dependency on the Western eco economic model. If um, there's the tenacity and drive to develop, you know, the local system, and I'd see like a there's no going back, right? And so you can't go back to subsistence lifestyle so much. Like, there are communities now that do it, you know, like, I think I've seen stats around saying like 80% subsistence, you know, so they're majority subsistence. I, I, I think of like a blending of our 
rural villages and communities with like the models that we saw in like you know Renaissance Europe of like you have a bread maker and you have a pasta maker and so you have these people that are have skills or a trade that then they contribute to the community and then so the community can then be resilient and independent from the greater system if you're create a system and a structure within that community to support the needs mm -hmm. you know and maybe you have a couple exports that brings in a little bit of money to uh, subsidize um, the needs that you still drop on because we're we are in a global economy at this point and we have global awareness and so expecting to go back to the roots is I'm on a tangent <laughs> food is medicine and traditional foods are medicine. And all the Alaskan Native people were, we were only what, colonized in the last 150 years, really, in some places, less in some places, longer on coastal communities, more so with Russian contact. And so, if, like, and I believe, like, that we had that relationship and, um, we were part of the earth and the earth was part of us and so that food that, that was a direct connection to who we are and we were a reflection of humanity on this piece of earth and in relation to the food that it provides and so then the sudden injection of um, all these food groups and like grains basically that uh, our bodies weren't adapted to now you see basically grains and sugar sugar and and alcohol and the things like byproducts that come from that, but now you see all these health disparities um, more in the urban centers where like that's all the food that's available to them, and so they just eat all this corn, wheat, soy, dairy, and just the body can't process it, and like there's nothing you can exercise all you want, you can. You know, drink as much water and exercise daily and your body's still just going to struggle to to process that food because we haven't adapted and you know humanity is resilient so I think that adaptation is in process and I think the ability to process the western foods you know varies quite a bit depending on your specific ancestors and like if you're part Athabascan and part white, such as myself, like, I don't struggle so much with um, eating wheat, but some of my relatives just, like, doesn't work. Right. So I, I think in SCF, at, at SCF, in other healthcare regional, um, the tribal health organizations around the state, there has been an emphasis and focus on integrating traditional foods, and it's amazing, and the the Real Food Act, I believe, the National Food Bill, um, helped to pave the way and open up doors for that. So now, like residential uh, facilities um, can serve traditional foods if it's donated. You know, so now have these elders and they can receive, you know, gull eggs and uh, whale and you know all these. Uh, things that they would otherwise have no access to are now being donated and maybe they're they've been separated from their community and don't have um, the providers still that direct link to their community anymore right it's really exciting and I think that we are currently in this revitalization of culture and identity and pride that goes with it um, and food is a big part of that and it's connected to our health directly absolutely 100% Mm -hmm. Want to be healthy? Eat your traditional foods. Right. <laughs> Doesn't matter, you know, what traditional foods it is. It could be, you know, kimchi if you're Korean. Right. Or, you know, just yeah. eat your traditional foods. Uh -huh. And some of it has made it into our perspective of what is traditional, like fry bread. Right. Like that came with colonization, really. Um, and but every like. My grandma makes the best fried bread. Just gonna put that out there yeah, okay. for all the world to hear. Well, <laughs> yeah, we'll see what Leela has to say about that. She has like an amazing like fried bread taco. Or and I think that it's a, an example of the blending and like the fact that we won't 
we are not going to go back in time. We shouldn't be focused on that, but we should be looking at how can we preserve the elements that are important and, and integrate them into our identity and way of living. And so I feel like that is sustainability. I agree. It's, it's a challenging proposition you know, with the growing population of the world. It's like, you can't say everyone should live subsistence. You can't do it. Mm-hmm. The world isn't vibrant and healthy and abundant enough anymore to do that. And right. We have had such population growth as a result of agriculture. Mm-hmm. So the question now is like, how do we sustain agriculture really in a more meaningful, ethical way that We've approached agriculture as mining. We like mine the earth, basically. Now we're we're mining it of its nutrients the way that we do monocropping and just are constantly putting down our plants, you know, pesticide, pulling it up, and then maybe an application of a little bit of you know chemical fertilizer, and then the same process. And so we're pulling that abundance from the earth again and again for the sustenance when you need to be looking at the entire nitrogen cycle and and building abundance while harvesting it. And you can have that relationship and that that balance of like the earth providing while providing for the earth and um, not just taking it. But with like, in my opinion, the invention of um, Ford's construction model or linear model of, you know, like, okay, hyper-specialized individuals and we'll put it all together, but nobody has to do it all because this is more efficient. And we've applied that to the way in which we do business across all sectors, including agriculture, and it doesn't work. You need that holistic, you know, big picture awareness and application to your practices. And considering that, like, you know, you said the Inuit, uh, you know, lived a a keto diet, you know, with fats and meats mostly. Um, And I think that was possible because the the incredible nutrient-dense nature of Alaska meats, Mm -hmm. you know, because it's a hard life and, like, even moose, like, they just are eating tons, can speak better to moose than whale, but... You know, they're eating tons of these diverse medicinal plants, Alaska plants, and so then they're rich in, you know, iron and vitamin K and, like, all these random nutrients that you don't find in, you know, factory farm beef, you know, or that sort of thing. And so the the nature of meat, you know, the traditional meats versus farm meats is an interesting topic, but then also... A concern of mine that I don't have an answer about is like when these bigger systems are impacting our food security, like Fukushima leaking into the ocean still today. Right. And who's like doing water testing? Who's testing the salmon that I'm eating, um, believing that it, there's nourishment in it, but it could be poisoning me. Mm-hmm. And so, like, even you, you, it feels like me to want to practice a subsistence lifestyle will not paying attention to the global climate of things, like global politics, global impacts of radiation, global war, all these things. It is similar to like, you know, an ostrich head in the sand, Mm -hmm. like, well, I can live my good life and that's what I need to do. And there's absolute value in that, but it's like, well, what are you doing to ensure that this perpetuates on and is available to your the future generations, to your grandchildren's grandchildren. Right. It almost seems like <clears throat> the lost cause of this one. <laughs> right? It's feeling pretty grim right now. The ocean is satisfying. <laughs> the, the globe is warming. Everything's dying. <laughs> going extinct. But how do we turn the scales? What do we do? That's the question. That, and I think that's what, you know, work like what you're doing here with the podcast. You know, it, it starts with community. Mm-hmm. It starts with conversation. That community becomes an example and says, no more, or this is what's important. It, it's readjusting our values. So I, the question that I continue to find myself thinking on is like, what am I doing 
to perpetuate tradition and to retain the knowledge. I guess what I'm saying 